Imagine a man who walked among giants of mathematics, but who still remains forgotten by the majority. A genius who deciphered mysteries of numbers and opened doors to discoveries that shaped modern science. Your name? Carl Ludwig Siegel. But who really was this mathematician? And why isn't his story told alongside names like Gauss, Euler, or Riemann? Get ready, because today you will discover the life and secrets of one of the greatest geniuses the world has ever seen. The greatest mathematicians of all time. Episode 4, Carl Ludwig Siegel. Carl Siegel was a German mathematician who worked on algebraic number theory and also on celestial mechanics. He was born on December 31, 1996, in Berlin, Germany, and died on April 4, 1981, in Göttingen, also in Germany. Carl Siegel's father worked at the post office. Siegel entered the University of Berlin in 1915 in the midst of World War I and attended lectures by Frobenius and Planck. According to Siegel himself, by teaching beginner classes in person, teachers were able to perceive, after just a few lessons, which of the students were most talented with the work they delivered, and teachers could direct the work accordingly. That's how he got in touch with my professors Frobenius and Planck. Initially, his intention was to study astronomy, but Frobenius's influence led him to number theory, which would become the main research topic of his career. In 1917, however, he had to interrupt his studies when he was called up for military service. Certainly, military life did not suit Siegel, and he was eventually discharged from the army as one of his failures as, despite his best efforts, they could not get him to adapt to military life. One would have to believe that Siegel would have classified this as a success rather than a failure. After the end of the war, Siegel continued his studies at Göttingen beginning in 1919. His doctoral thesis at Göttingen was supervised by Edmund Landau, and Siegel then continued to study for his habilitation. His dissertation, written in 1920, was a milestone in the history of Diophantine approaches. Schanflies was appointed professor at the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University of Frankfurt in 1914, the year the new university was inaugurated. He was 61 when he was appointed, and when he retired in 1922, Siegel was appointed professor to succeed him in Frankfurt. Although Schanflies spent the six years of his retirement in Frankfurt, his days as an active mathematician were already over when Siegel took up the chair. There were, however, a number of young mathematicians on the Frankfurt team who, with Siegel, would create an excellent center for mathematics. Hellinger, as well as Schonflies, was appointed professor at the new University of Frankfurt when it was inaugurated in 1914, and Saas was appointed private docent in the same year. Saas was promoted to professor in 1921, Epstein was appointed in 1919, and Den in 1921. It was a strong and stimulating department that Siegel joined in 1922. There were a number of activities in which the four mathematicians, Siegel, Hellinger, Epstein, and Thane, collaborated. One of these was the seminar on the history of mathematics, instigated by Thane in 1922. Siegel wrote in 1978, Looking back now, those community hours in seminary are some of the happiest memories of my life. Even back then, I enjoyed the activity that brought us together every Thursday afternoon from 4 to 6. And later, when we were scattered around the world, I learned, through disappointing experiences elsewhere, how unlucky it is to have fellow academics working together selflessly, without thinking about personal ambitions, rather than just issuing directives from their lofty positions. The seminar on the history of mathematics would last 13 years. They made a rule that they would study all mathematical works in their original languages, and although this reduced the number of students attending seminary, there were never fewer than six. They studied the works of mathematicians including Euclid, Archimedes, Fibonacci, Cardan, Stephen, Vieque, Kepler, Desargues, Descartes, Fermat, 
Huygens, Barrow, and Gregory. The aim of the seminar was to increase the understanding of the participating students about the results presented in the lectures and to provide teachers with the aesthetic satisfaction of examining in detail the exceptional works of the past. The Mathematics History Seminar was not the only one in which Siegel attended in Frankfurt, as the professors also organized a pro-seminar and a seminar. Student numbers increased rapidly after Siegel's appointment. In the beginning, he only taught a few students. He recalls, I remember having only two students in one of the advanced courses. One day, both were late for class because of the delay in the university office. When they arrived, they were shocked to find that I had started without them and had already filled an entire section of the chalkboard. By 1928, Siegel was teaching 143 students in the Differential and Integral Calculus course and had to put in many hours of work correcting the students' exercises. It was at this time that the number of students peaked, then began to fall again. On January 30, 1933, Hitler came to power, and on April 7, 1933, the Civil Service Act provided the means to remove Jewish professors from universities. This did not affect Siegel, who was an Aryan, to use the terminology of the time that Siegel hated, and at this stage, it did not affect Epstein, Hellinger, or Den, who, although Jewish, were under a clause that exempted non-Aryans who had fought for Germany in World War I. Zaz, however, was dismissed from his position. Although Siegel was unaffected by the Civil Service Act, he hated the Nazi regime, and this was the beginning of a very unhappy period for him. In 1935, Siegel spent a year at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton in the United States. He returned to Frankfurt to find that the problems of his fellow Jews had become much worse. Following the decisions of the Party Congress at Nuremberg in the autumn of 1935, Epstein, Hellinger, and Den were forced to leave their posts. They remained in Frankfurt, unable to teach. In late 1937, Siegel accepted a professorship at Göttingen and moved there in early 1938. In Göttingen, he led a somewhat reserved life. Life in Göttingen was still influenced by Nazi policies, and mathematicians reacted in different ways to political pressures. For example, Hasse in Göttingen wanted to accept the habilitation thesis of his assistant, but Siegel and Hellinger felt that this was a political rather than a mathematical decision by Hasse and prevented the habilitation from being accepted. The Nazi regime drove Germany into war in 1939, and Siegel felt he could no longer remain in his homeland. In early 1940, he left Germany, teaching first in Denmark and then in Norway. In March of 1940, he met with Den in Norway. Den had fled Germany in fear for his life and was teaching in Trondheim when Siegel visited him. Siegel saw German merchant ships in the harbor and only later, having left Norway for the United States, did he discover that the ships he had seen were the advance group of the German invasion force. Siegel described his time in the United States as a self-imposed exile in America. He worked at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton from 1940 to 1951, being appointed a permanent professor in 1946. However, in 1951, he returned to Germany and worked again in Göttingen for the rest of his career. E. H. Hlauka's 1985 paper, entitled Number Theory, lists Siegel's impressive contributions to mathematics under seven headings. They are Approximation of Algebraic Numbers by Rationals and Their Applications to Diophantine Equations, Transcendence Issues, in particular Values of Certain Functions at Algebraic Points, Zeta functions, including applications in class numbers. Geometry of numbers and their applications to algebraic number theory. Life in Göttingen was still influenced by Nazi policies, and mathematicians reacted in different ways to political pressures. For example, Hasse in Göttingen wanted to accept the habilitation thesis of his assistant, 
but Siegel and Hergolotz felt that this was a political rather than a mathematical decision by Haas and prevented the habilitation from being accepted. Hardy Littlewood method, including wearing type problems for algebraic numbers, quadratic forms, analytic theory, and modular forms. Celestial mechanics. Siegel is especially famous for his work on number theory, where he played an eminent role. Schneider, who was a student of Siegel, gave three lectures on Siegel's contributions to number theory to the German Mathematical Union in 1982. They are reproduced in T. Schneider's 1983 paper Das Werk C. L. Siegel's in der Zahlen Theory and describes Siegel's most important results in number theory. These include his improvement of Thue's theorem, given in his 1920 dissertation, and his application to certain polynomial Diophantine equations in two unknowns, proving a genus-affine curve of at least one over a numerical field that has only a finite number of integers, in 1929. Perhaps his two-part article that appeared in 1929 is the most profound and original. In the 1929 paper, Siegel made a substantial contribution to transcendence theory, especially a new method for the algebraic independence of values from certain E functions. He proved that if jota to the power of zero is the Bessel function of sub-zero, then for any algebraic integer other than zero r, he showed that jota to the power of zero r is transcendental. He had previously written, in 1922, papers on the functional equation of Dedekind's zeta functions of fields of algebraic numbers, and in 1921 to 23, he made contributions to additive questions, such as wearing type problems for fields of algebraic numbers. He made further contributions to the latter topic in 1944. Siegel's research into the analytic theory of quadratic forms in 1935 to 1937 was of fundamental importance, and he broke new ground by considering quadratic forms in which the coefficients were of a field of algebraic numbers. Klingen discusses Siegel's contributions to complex analysis. In particular, he studied automorphic functions in several complex variables Siegel's modular functions, which led to a much deeper understanding. In this general area, Siegel considered the theory of discontinuous groups and their fundamental domains, algebraic relations between modular functions and between modular forms and Fourier series of modular forms. Siegel's work in celestial mechanics, which came after number theory on his list of favorite topics, is discussed by Russman in 1983. The article lists eight major contributions that Siegel made to the subject. He studied the field problem and Brun's theorem on algebraic integrals, the restricted problem of three bodies and their integrals, which used the results that Siegel had previously proved, the orbit of the moon, again essentially a three-body problem, Siegel presented a much improved version of the lunar theory developed by Hill. The Lagrangian solutions to the problem of the three bodies, Siegel developed general methods for determining periodic orbits close to equilibrium points. The problem of small dividers, where Siegel first obtained convergence results. Birkhoff's normal forms. He examined Birkhoff's work on perturbation theory solutions to analytical Hamiltonian differential equations close to an equilibrium point using series of formal powers. Siegel gave examples of systems that did not have convergent transformations to a normal form. An interesting episode, which tells us a lot about Siegel's approach to mathematics, occurred in the 1960s. Serge Lang published Diophantine Geometry in 1962, and Mordell wrote a critical review two years later. Siegel then wrote to Mordell, 
When I first saw Lang's diaphantine geometry about a year ago, I was disgusted by how my own contributions to the subject have been defaced and rendered unintelligible. My feeling is very well expressed when you mention Rip Van Winkle. The author's entire style contradicts the sense of simplicity and honesty that we admire in the works of the masters of number theory. Lagrange, Gauss, or, to a lesser extent, Hardy, Landau. Lang has just published another book on algebraic numbers that in my opinion is even worse than the previous one. I see a pig invading a beautiful garden and uprooting all the flowers and trees. Unfortunately, there are many fellow travelers who have already disgraced much of algebra and function theory. However, until now, number theory had not been touched. These people remind me of the cheeky behavior of the National Socialists who chanted, Wir werden weiter marschieren, bis alles in Scherben zerfällt. I fear that mathematics will perish by the end of this century if the current trend of meaningless abstraction, as I call it, empty set theory, is not stopped. Jean Dioudon, who writes that Siegel never married, devoted his life to research. But Dioudon explains why he believes Siegel had few PhD students. The perfection and thoroughness of his papers did not leave much room for improvement with the same technique, and this discouraged many research students. For to obtain better results than he did, new methods were needed. Siegel liked to teach, however, even elementary courses, and published textbooks on number theory, celestial mechanics, and the theory of functions of several complex variables. He received many honors, perhaps the most prestigious of which was the Wolf Award in 1978. Siegel died of natural causes at his home in Göttingen. Carl Ludwig Siegel did not seek fame, he sought the truth in numbers, and in this search he left a legacy that still inspires mathematicians around the world today. You may not hear his name in every book, but every time the math progresses, there's a little bit of Siegel in there. And now that you know his story, what do you think? Does he deserve to be remembered alongside the greatest geniuses of humanity? Write your opinion here in the comments, because I really want to know. And if you like to discover the hidden secrets of math and science, subscribe now to the channel and activate the bell so you don't miss the next stories. The next genius may surprise you even more.